Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and this is the Gospel according to Moses in the book of Genesis. Again, a Christian Bible study on the Torah. We're in Lesson 76, and we're at the point where Jacob has been with his uncle Laban, in Hebrew, Laban, in English, as we understand it, for 20 years, and he's now leaving. It's the time, it's a time where the Lord basically has given an instruction to him to leave. His, his family has grown. He's got two wives, Rachel and Leah, and a bunch of kids, 11 boys and one girl. Benjamin has not been born yet. But as they're getting ready to leave, Rachel, she steals the family gods. Now, the Hebrew is teraphim. It doesn't say Elohim. Strong's number is 8655, and this is a domestic idol, probably used for divination, and perhaps like a human figurine. Now, you'll hear people teach that Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. That's going to be coming up. And she's punished by God because she's punished by God because she stole the gods. Th this is taught widely. The source is rabbinic speculation. In other words, God executed Rachel? What? And again, where does that come from? And like I said, the source really seems to be Rabbinic Midrash. Midrash basically is the Hebrew word. The results from study. Darash is study. Midrash is what you get out of study. But with regards to this, this notion about Rachel stealing the gods, you guys, that's <laughs> stuck with us for a long time. But based upon fact that we have Jewish scholars and Christian scholars working together for the first time, based upon the fact that one of the key ways that we're studying the Bible now is putting the Bible in its historical context, we can ask the question, did God execute Rachel? He couldn't have. But when we put the Bible in its historical context and we actually look at what the Bible says and we compare other verses in other situations, we get an answer to the truth. Did God execute Rachel? Couldn't have. So come, let's become conscious of the truth of God's word as he's inspiring us today to go deeper in his word to understand the truth of his word to see how historical fact and background help us to see the truth. You ready? Come, let's go study. Genesis 31.5, Jacob, and 31.5, I believe in 31.5, he's talking to uh, Rachel and Leah. And he says to them, he's saying this to Rachel and Leah. He doesn't say to Rachel and Leah, Rachel, Leah, our God has done this, or our God has, he doesn't say that. He said, the God of my father has done this. Now that's interesting, okay? 31.29 Lavan says, or Laban, okay, it's actually Lavan in Hebrew, he's talking to Jacob and he said, the God of your fathers. And then in 3142, Jacob again says, the God of my father, because I think in 3142, I think he's talking to Lavan again. The, re the reason I bring that up is this, but especially to his wives, why does he say the God of my fathers to Rachel and Leah? And it seems... Pretty, it seems clear to me that Rachel and Leah, okay, may have had knowledge of the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of their husband, but not Yada. 
they're pagan. They're still surrounded in that pagan culture. It probably would take them a while, okay, as they're now in a marriage relationship with Jacob, and I would imagine ancient marriages mean I've got to take on the gods of my husband, okay? His gods have to become my gods now. But the thing is, is that this phrase seems to imply that the God of my father, he's saying this to Rachel and Leah to specify so they understand which God he's talking about. If he just said God, that didn't make any sense. He says the God of my father. It implies that Rachel and Leah were still bought into their pagan culture. It implies that. It doesn't say it, but implies it because Jacob is saying that. So they're not real believers. Now we Christians, I mean, whew. for instance, let's look at this statement. Deuteronomy 6.4. I, I started it before. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. All right. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. And you know it in your verses, the Lord is one. Okay. But actually the word Echad does not mean one. Not the way you think of it. Okay. It means the one and only. It means alone. There's no other. So another way of reading that verse is... Okay, the Lord is our God, the Lord, and he's the only one. That got the Jews in trouble for 5,000 years. And it got you in trouble. Let me explain. John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. Can anybody finish the verse? What, did, what was it? No one. No one. There's no other way to the Father but through Jesus. Do you understand how our society today resents that statement even in the church? Oh, there's many ways to God. What is God saying? This is God's very own words. There is only one way. There is only Eloheinu Echad, our God, the one and only alone. In the pagan culture, what you find when you study paganism, one, pag uh, one tribe and another tribe, or one nation and another nation, if they're, if they're pagan, okay, they had a lot of uh, tolerance, okay, for other gods. They wouldn't believe in the other gods. We've got our gods, you got your gods. That's fine, okay? In Egypt, every, <laughs> I was reading this, in Egypt, during the time of Moses and the time of Exodus and so on, every town had their own town god. So you go to another town, hey, who's your God? Ah, my God is that tree over there. Whoa, really? We got a rock. Wow, okay. Is your God bigger than my God? Well, no, your God is a tree, mine is a rock. But if we beat you in a war, okay, then our rock, if we're, we're the rock people, okay, so if we're the rock people and we beat the tree people, our rock is stronger than your tree. So our God is bigger. But see, Christians and Jews, what do they say? You got gods? Wow, that's great. There is no other God. You just destroyed their entire religion. They don't like you. They don't like us. Dennis Prager talks about the fact, and he says, why are there Jews? He's got a book that he wrote, Why Are There Jews? And he said, this has gotten us in trouble for 5,000 years. What are you going to do? You come to the Romans, okay? And the Romans defeat Israel. And they control Israel, especially during Jesus' day. The Romans got him, right? The emperor is God. <laughs> No, you're not. There is only one God. And he's not you, and he's not Jupiter. Okay, he's not any of your gods, because they don't exist. These Jews are teaching these pagan cultures that all of their gods are false, their religion is false, their worldview is false. This gets you in a lot of trouble. Very interesting. So, so for Rachel and Leah, they're probably saying, yeah, our God is the God of our husband." He, he's one of our gods because something happens and the only way we can rationalize it is Rachel and Leah must be still caught up in their culture. In other words, the God of my husband is one of our gods, okay? Not Eloheinu Echad, okay, our God alone. Because we go into 3119, and in 3119, 3119, we read this, And Lavan went to shear his sheep, 
Now Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's. She stole the household gods. This shows that indeed she's embedded in her culture. But it's fascinating that when you start trying to figure out why, I'm going to go into the JPS Torah commentary by uh, Sarna, a tremendous scholarly work and especially scholarly commentary. What were these household gods? And as Sarna says, the reasons for her taking the gods is very obscure. We don't know why. All we can do is guess. On culture, on history, they're called teraphim. And uh, in other texts, uh, in the Greek Septuagint and uh, Aramaic uh, translations of the uh, Old Testament, they're called idols. Okay, they're not called idols here. Okay, there is a word for idols in Hebrew, but they're not called, they're called teraphim. But in other works, Greek Septuagint and in the Aramaic translation of the Bible, they're called idols. It seems as Teraphim in 2 Kings 23, 24. You can write that down if you're interested. 2 Kings 23, 24. Teraphim are listed together with Gelulim and Shekutzim, uh, which are a list of idolatrous abominations outlawed by King Josiah. So they're part of it. doesn't say what they are, but they're part of idolatrous, idolatrous abominations. They're not all of the same size. Some are big, some are small. So basically, when you're looking about household gods, okay, I know there was a household god in Egypt that stood about this high, okay, and it had a big beer belly, and it was the ugliest god that you ever wanted to see, okay? It's, um, the question is, what's their function? Um, is it possibly they were called, in the New Z text, they were called family gods, uh, for Rome, they had ro- household gods, and they were said to protect the food supply and basically the general well-being of the family. So they had household gods. You will remember that in the Gladiator movie. Okay, in the Gladiator movie, the Gladiator had a little bag. That's his household gods. Okay, and he had them set up with little candles, and one was a picture of his wife. One was a little statue of his wife as well. Okay, but he he set those up so he had his gods. He had his gods with him. That's this. That's what we're talking about. Another thing that household god, these household gods might be connected to a birthright. Sarna doesn't think that Rachel was taking them because she wanted to somehow secure her inheritance and birthright, okay, with Levant, because she's leaving forever. She's not going to come back. She's got a new husband. And basically in the ancient Near East, when you married somebody and you're going to go to your husband's house, you never go back home again. That's it. It's over. Not like today. So that is one possibility. And again, as uh, the JPS would say, it's unclear to exactly what they are. Now, the rabbis, bless their heart, okay, they've got the answer. Okay, so I want to let you know what the rabbis say. I bless, bless these guys. They always have an answer. And they know why that she took them. So in verse 19, Rachel stole the teraphim that belonged to her father. The teraphim were idols. I, I love the way they make that statement. We don't know if they are. Now, I know where the, I know where the rabbis would get this, all right, from the Greek Septuagint. They're called idols from the Aramaic Targums, which are translations of the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic. They're called idols. They're not called idols in the Bible. They're called teraphim. What are they? They might be idols, but here they say they're idols. Okay? The Torah records... Uh, and here it is, and this is the reason why she did this. Rachel took them to keep Laban from worshiping the idols. Really? Many consider them to... Now, there's, to give credit, though, sometimes they make statements that I, I really can't buy intellectually. I can't buy that intellectually. Because remember, what we're trying to do is treat... What does the Torah teach? Okay? And Orthodox Jewish rabbis sometimes... Uh, they're reading in between the lines, and sometimes when they're reading in between the lines, what they're reading in between the lines they're saying is true. Sorry. Okay. This is like, okay, and this is, uh, who was it? Tarashi. 
Okay, and Rashi, that's his opinion, but he's not saying, my opinion is, he's saying, these are idols, and I'm Rashi. Who are you? Okay, I'm the great Rashi, guess who I am? And bless the man's heart. But, for instance here, uh, many considered them to have been household idols, which is historically true. Okay, so we have a mixture of rabbinical opinion and real history in here, real archaeology. Supposed to be protectors of the home, uh, similar uh, later in Rome, uh, and also were consulted as oracles, which is act actually true. But I'm studying this, and I'm, I, I'm going someplace with this, okay? Because this event her stealing these idols has bothered me okay it really has bothered me so much and i've got to delve with so since it bothered me it's gonna bother you okay but i'm studying this and one scholar has said why isn't anybody paying attention to josephus josephus has an opinion, which is good, a, a historical opinion. This guy is the oldest source we have, okay? So I did my search and I said, okay, I gotta find it. It just so happens, this is probably, um, I didn't read it thoroughly, but I wanna give you the historical background. This is probably in the days of about, um, let's say 50, 60 AD, okay? Because they mention here King Agrippa, Herod Agrippa. Um, but there were Jews in Babylon still. So the story goes on about two Jews in Babylon who actually secure weapons and they're gonna start a revolt. And in this revolt, uh, they uh, happen to uh, capture, okay, a uh, Babylonian princess. And she was led away captive. And they were going to marry her, not rape her or anything like that, But because this one guy, and his name was Analeus. And Analeus really loved her. Okay? I think they had an affair even before. Yeah, they had an affair together. So they, she loved him, and he wanted to marry her. But she was married, so the husband has got to get out of the way. So he killed him. Since she was led away captive upon the death of her husband, she concealed the image of those gods which were their country gods, their household gods, common to her husband and to herself. Now it was the custom of that country for all to have the idols they worshipped in their own houses and to carry them along with them when they go into a foreign land, agreeable to which customs of theirs she carried her idols with her. This is, this is the story of Rachel. So this is, and this is in the same area. I find this fascinating. So it's a real possibility for protection uh, and uh, for blessing. So now she steals the gods. And it seems like there is a rationale for her to do that. The, it, it seems as if when Jacob says to her and Leah, the God of my fathers, or the God of my father. Um, why didn't he say our God? Or why, did he, why didn't he say God? He didn't say that. He said the God of my father. And so that implies, again, they're still connected to their pagan culture. Then we go to Genesis uh, 31 and 19 through 37. And I'm going to actually basically review that so in 19 she steals the gods they leave Lavan Laban does not know that they left okay now what's fascinating is Rachel stole her father's gods and then in the next statement in here in the Jerusalem Bible it says and Yaakov outwitted Lavan the army okay it doesn't say outwitted in Hebrew it says he stole his heart which is a Hebrew phrase for lied, okay? Deceived, well, Jacob's good at this. But God told him to get out of town. You know, in other words, what did, Jacob didn't lie, lie, okay? In other words, he basically outwitted Levon. He got out of town and he just didn't tell him. Now the Torah is saying he stole his heart, 
okay? Deceived his heart, covered his heart, whatever. It's, it's fascinating. We come to, so Levon catches up, and Jacob makes this statement because Levon, uh, Laban, uh, says, this is going to be in verse 30 and 31, and now, though you wouldst needs be gone, because thou dost long after thy father's house, yet why have you stolen my gods? And Yaakov answered and said to Levan, because I was afraid. Now, he didn't steal. I was afraid, so I left secretly. He's answering two questions. So when you read that, I was afraid. That's why he left secretly. But then it said, uh, perhaps thou wouldst take uh, by force the daughters from me. But anyone whom thou dost find thy gods, let him not live. Now, that's a rash statement. Can you imagine? Here's Jacob. Here's Laban, and here's Rachel on the camel right behind Jacob. And she hears that. Whoa. I mean, that's probably got to make her feel a little uncomfortable. So it is a rash statement. Now, the Humash, going to the rabbis, they make a statement in here. And this, I think, is a statement that I respect but disagree with vehemently and i'm going to show you biblically why okay so the orthodox rabbis say jacob pronounced a curse on the person who stole the gods <sighs> okay it's curse a curse that came true with rachel's premature death premature death childbirth in the ancient near east was the leading cause of death among women. That's not premature death. That's just natural death. For as the sages teach, this is very important. For as the sages teach, even an unintentional curse that escapes the lips of a righteous must come true. Unintentional curse must come true. Really? God is going to kill Rachel? Whoa. Let me go to the GPS Torah commentary. I want you to hear this. Sarna says, It's uncertain whether this phrase shall not remain alive. Is, there to, is, is it judicial or rhetorical? Now, what he means by rhetorical here is, is it a way of expressing your feelings about an event to the person you're trying to communicate to. It's just a way of saying something, okay? Like, for instance, uh, I do this a lot. Somebody might come to me and say, did you hear about Larry? No, I didn't. What happened? Larry lost his job. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. Oh, really? If you analyze that, that's a real stupid thing to say. Oh, really? Yeah, really? What, what, you think I'm lying to you? Okay. Oh, my gosh. Well, did that affect you? It's, it's a statement that you use. Okay. And that person understands. I mean, I probably said that to some of you sometime. Okay. Oh, really? Oh, my. I do that a lot. Okay. Could it be that Jacob is doing the same thing? Wow, somebody stole your gods? Oh, man, that's a serious thing. Let them die. Okay? Or it could very well be he could have said something rhetorical like, oh, man, that's really serious. You know, I hope a horse falls on their head. <laughs> Meaning this is pretty serious. Okay? That's possible. So when we go into this, we go to Genesis 44:9. No, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to tell you the I'm going to tell you the situation because we're going to get there anywhere. In Genesis 44:9, you'll remember the story. Benjamin has now come with the boys to visit Joseph in Egypt, and they're going home. And what does Joseph do? That stinker. He says, "Yeah, give them gold and silver and what? And in Benjamin's bag, put my divination cup." Okay, and you remember, they go, they catch him, they bring it back. And what does Judah say? Judah says, whoever stole your cup, let him die. 
the exact same phrase. Did Benjamin die? No, but every unintentional curse done will be done by God. It's, it doesn't make sense. So the Bible, situations, that's an unintentional curse on Benjamin. Same phrase, same idea. Unintentional curse. And the Orthodox would say, God is going to kill Benjamin. Well, Benjamin finally died sometime. I don't know when. Okay, I don't think the Bible even specifies when Benjamin died. So the rivals would say, see? <laughs> no! <laughs> okay. So it's likely that it is this rhetorical. But besides that, no one in the ancient Near East, no one, I don't care what, um, I don't care what law code you use, the, uh, the, the code of Ma'at in Egypt, uh, Hammurabi's law code, you can look all of these up. If you steal something, you're not going to die. Okay, technically speaking, you're probably going to have to pay something back. Later on in the Torah, we're going to find this. If a thief, okay, wants, uh, was stole, he's stolen that time, and he's found out, and he wants to repent. What happens? He has to pay back everything plus 200%. Double. It's very interesting. So it's, it's payback, okay? Not going to jail. So again, it seems as if this could be a statement and it seems like Torah is giving us the answer. And I think Torah is giving us an answer that few people really pay attention to until I'm it's with Sarna and I'm with Dr. John Kareed and his commentary and so on. There's a very interesting statement before Rachel dies. Okay, let me show you. I think it gets her off the hook. Genesis 35, 1 through 4. Now, this is Genesis 35. I've skipped over an awful lot, okay? Dina's rape. They come to Shaka I, we, We'll deal with that next week. Look at this. But we're I've got to follow this through, okay? I'm not teaching verse by verse in order. I can't wait to get to the... I've got to give you the conclusion now on some of this stuff. So I'm trying to take this whole concept. Genesis 35, starting in verse 1, And God said to Yaakov, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar to God, who appeared to thee when thou didst flee from the face of Esau, thy brother. Then Yaakov said to his household, Stop. He's now talking to his household. All right? What's the Hebrew word here? It's very interesting because the word is bait. Strong's number, H1004. So for instance, Beit Lechem. Bethlehem. Beit Lechem, the house of bread. But Beit is conceptual, remember? So the conceptual meaning here has a variety of uses and a variety of meanings. It really is a place of abode, of a place of a dwelling, the place of where you are. It's not even necessarily have to be a dwelling place. So it'd be a house, a tent, a temple, an abode, okay? A family. You dwell in a family. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, you belong to something somewhere and to people. So basically, it's the family. Let me ask you a question. Jacob said to his household, is Rachel part of the family? He's talking to her. It doesn't say, and Rachel was, you know, doing her hair. And to all that were with him, everybody. Put away the strange gods that are among you. And make yourselves clean. And change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make there an altar to God who answers me in the day of my distress. And was with me in the way on which I went. And then listen to this. And they, who does that refer to? The household. the household. All of them. And they gave to Yaakov all the strange gods 
which were in their hand. The phrase in their hand in Hebrew, in their possession, what belongs to me, not in their hand. The Torah implies, or is lying, that Rachel's part of the household and she gave up the gods. And they buried them at the Oak of Moray near Shechem. So now, think about it. We'll go back to the rabbinical statement. God is going to kill Rachel and she gave up the gods? It, it, it doesn't make sense at all. And Benjamin's not killed. Now, he didn't steal anything. But there was an unintentional curse. So it makes sense that Rachel somehow is going through an act of forgiveness. So we talked about the different point of view. By the way, on this verse that I just gave you, Genesis 35, 1 through 4, I looked at all the Orthodox commentaries that I have. No Orthodox rabbi will comment on verse 4, where they all return the gods. Not one. Because that verse contradicts exactly what they said, that God cursed Rachel. Not one. I was looking everywhere. Rachel died in childbirth in the ancient Near East. The leading cause of death for women? Childbirth. It's very dangerous to have children. So she's having her second, and she died in childbirth. Do you realize that some of you are not going to die in bed by just falling asleep? Do you realize that? <laughs> some of you are going to die from cancer. Some of you are going to die. I don't even want to bring up stuff. We don't know how we're going to die, do we? We're going to die. Is that a curse? Some of us might really suffer. Huh? It's the curse. Oh, it's the curse, and we know Jesus is going to defeat death. Yes, thank God. Thank you, Judy. That's very good. That, that is very good. But I mean, our, our natural lives, okay, she died naturally. There's nothing evil about that. Like I said, it's a leading cause. And it makes no sense that God would have killed Rachel, that he would have to somehow, in other words, um, show himself to be true, to say, oh yeah, Jacob cursed her, so therefore I've got to follow through on Jacob's words. Let me give you an example. I was looking up at some of the woman, women in the Bible. Remember Rahab? She was a prostitute. She was a pagan. Okay? Did God save her? Mm -hmm. Yep. A matter of fact, she is an ancestor of Jesus. Oi, 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 oi. Bathsheba. Willing partner with David. I wonder if David suggested to her, I know how to get rid of the husband. Was she as an accessory to the fact of the murder? Was she saved? Yeah. Seemingly. Remember the woman caught in adultery? She was caught in adultery. I believe those guys. Jesus says, go and sin no more. Look what God's doing. Rachel. Come on, the Syrophoenician woman. This is in Matthew 15. You'll remember Jesus was in the city of Tyre and Sidon. So he's way up on the coast, north of Haifa. Haifa didn't exist in those days, but that is Phoenician territory. That's pagan territory, okay? Jews did not live there. Oh, there were probably Jews living there, but it was not really Jewish territory. Do you remember the pagan mother? Her daughter was sick. And she's crying out to Jesus, come and save my daughter. And Jesus says, I've come for the Jews only. And she said, well, even the dogs get the scraps. And he said, your faith is amazing. And he healed her. Didn't convert her. It doesn't say, oh, and by the way, I'm Jesus. Would you accept me as Lord and Savior and say the sinner's prayer? Okay, she didn't say that. Okay, he just walked on. So I always find that interesting. Okay, he didn't say that. So... So when we take a look at Rachel, she's a pagan beauty. She's associated with the God of Israel, right? She's married into, the, married into the religion. We don't know if and when she ever, or if ever, she said, Adonai Echad. In other words, God is the only God. We don't know. It seems as if what the Torah is teaching us, that she gave up the gods. All. 
She obeys her husband, seemingly destroys her gods. God blessed Rachel with a second son, with Benjamin. To me, Torah is saying that God is the same in the New Testament and the Old Testament again. God loved Rachel. Just as Lee liked Hagar. Remember her? The angel of the Lord appeared for the first time, according to the Torah, to her, an Egyptian pagan. Not to Sarah. Not to Abraham. The angel of the Lord appeared. No, yeah, God did talk to Abraham. But appeared. That's the first time the angel of the Lord, God, comes to manifest himself so that Hagar sees and hears. That's amazing. And Rachel died. Okay. She died a natural death. One that was very, very common. Just like us. John's question was, there is that statement, and that's in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. That's the first time that it appears. Now, what's interesting, too, in the Deuteronomy, those are all Moses' words. In other words, you know, God's not speaking there. Moses is teaching. That's the first time. You know, to get the word Adonai, his name, Yahweh, because we know Adonai covers the word Yahweh. Okay, in the Hebrew. So Adonai Echad, God, the one and only God. Uh, if, if I'm correct, that's the first time that phrase is actually used and actually taught by Moses. No place else. Now we know it here. I don't think either in the stories of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob do we get any statements by God. You help me guys with this. That God said you'll not worship any other gods. I don't think there's any command like that. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that would be the first time. And it was Moses teaching that. Certainly, Rachel and Leah, they really kind of mad at their father. From I mean, this is what the Torah seems to imply. And could it very well be that the gods that she stole may have some sort of a value? They could be solid gold, for that matter. You know, and said, well, wait a minute, he took away our riches, and we know he blessed our husband, okay, but uh, we've, we don't have anything. And so is that is that a possibility that the motive is in there? Maybe. Like I said, real scholarship says th there's, there's room for debate here, you know. And uh, sometimes when there's room for debate, you know, when God doesn't really specifically answer the question, maybe that's not the point. You know, it, it's fun to continue debating and we may learn more things from there. It's like God would say, um, who's the Pharaoh of the Exodus? And God is kind of saying, who cares? That's not the point. Well, here's, here's a good one. Jesus did not die on a Friday. He died on a Thursday. Now, that's my position. The, do you understand that God never tells you? He has his last supper, the Passover meal of the Messiah, the night before the Passover lamb is slain. The Passover lamb is slain on Passover at the ninth hour, okay? And so that means the Jewish people will have their Seder. They didn't call it a Seder in those days. Their Passover meal, okay, after sundown on that day. But that's all we know. It's according to the Jewish calendar. It doesn't say Friday. So Jesus never said on April 3rd in the year 30 AD or April 6th in the year 33 AD. He never said that. What's the point? It's not important. Oh, I think it's fun to speculate, okay? And I think 30 AD is, and I'm going to, Barb, uh, Don, when we do that, I, I, oh, we're going to have some fun with that. That's going to be a fun class. Whew, you better buy the book because all the theory is in there. But anyway, um, with regards to that, so the speculation, it's all part of that. And maybe we're still looking at the heart of the matter that she did steal this stuff, Okay. Let me end off with this. Let me end off and then we're going to end because I'm way over time in here. I want to make one point uh, for next week. And that is this. Uh, I want to let you know that there is no Bible commentary you can buy. Okay. That's complete. None. Okay. I've got five of them. And everyone's different. It's, it's amazing. I like the JPS Torah commentary, and I'll be using this as a standard because it is really Jewish historians, religious historians who are coming out with this stuff. And they will actually read in here and they'll say, and the rabbis would have this point of view. However, history suggests this. Okay. 
So we're really trying to delve at what does the Torah say, what does the Torah not say. Here's John Kareed. Okay, he has, he's written his Torah. It's excellent, excellent. Matter of fact, there are many times where he's going to agree with Sarna. And matter of fact, I think he's reading the JPS Torah commentary for his book as well. He's got it referenced in here. Okay, but he is a archaeologist. And so he brings things in here that I never heard of before. So just think of this. For instance, do you realize there are books, thick books, thick, thick books written on Genesis chapter 1? You, you can't, I mean, guys, uh, the very word of God is too deep, too wide, too high. Too, I mean, there is no commentary that does it. This is God's word. So I want to let you know that the gospel according to Moses, what we're doing, okay, is we're adding to the pile. That's all we're doing. I'm hoping it's a resource to you, okay, so that you can look at the Bible, you can look and say, huh, that's a different, Josephus, not one of these scholars, not one, Reference Josephus. I got it from, it wasn't even a commentary. It was a study on Josephus. I bumped into it. So you see what I mean? And Josephus brings out about carrying gods for blessing. It really, and this woman stole the gods, just like Rachel. It's fascinating. So for what I'm trying to do, you guys, is just bring a different perspective. Okay? Uh, I love all the commentaries I have. I also love, please don't get me wrong, the Humash. The Orthodox Jewish Commentary, I love those guys. Okay, I know some of the history behind Rashi and Maimonides and all these guys, and they were deeply devout men of God. Okay, I sometimes vehemently disagree with their point of view. Okay, but they're Jewish, and maybe there's something I'm missing here with what their intention is. Seriously, so I'm going to be, what would you call it, um, giving them the benefit of the doubt. Okay, and sometimes I will bring them into the discussion because sometimes their points are very good. Okay, but remember, I deal with history and archaeology. So to end off with that, okay, we will continue next week and we will be dealing with archaeology because here's an archaeological report that if you don't know this report, people are going to come up to you and say, this Bible of yours? Ha, what a bunch of hooey. And it's right in the story of Jacob. And if you don't know it, people who do not know the Bible, who are not Christian, who are atheists, who not love God and that type of stuff, will come in there and they will challenge you. And you need an answer. Nowhere in any of this stuff does it talk about it. So I'm going to give you archaeology. Okay? It's in a footnote in the archaeological Bible ESV by Christian scholars. So we come to the end of Lesson 76, and this lesson is a perfect example of how certain rabbinic, orthodox rabbinic midrash, and that is their results from study, are really their speculation and orthodox rabbinic opinion that really go against what the Bible actually says in going against the actual context of what we're reading. And it has shaped, shaped really even Christian beliefs. Mistaken ideas and beliefs. Now, if God executed Rachel for stealing the family gods, this, this contradicts the Bible. And, and, and we just saw that in this lesson. But today, God is really revealing himself and his truth via archaeology and history and geography and customs and culture and the ancient languages of the ancient Middle East. There are Jewish scholars and Christian scholars, rabbinic Jewish scholars, and Christian scholars that are seeking the real truth, the reality of what God's word is saying. That's why I depend upon Dennis Prager as one of them. 
or Dr. John Kareed. Yeah, there are certain places that I would disagree with him, and Dennis Prager as well. But these guys are emphasizing the Bible in its historical context. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible not say? God's doing this now. He's doing it for us, his sheep of his sheepfold. And this results, you guys, in our faith being enhanced, in our understanding, understanding of his word being enriched. Now, in Lesson 77, we're going to study an ama about an amazing archaeological find. It's called the Karka Stella. That's a stone, large tablet with writing on it was discovered in 1861. It's now in the British Museum. And this writing on the stela refers to the Assyrian king Shalmanazer III, his military campaigns, but specifically it gives us the date, the critical date of 853 BC and the Battle of Karkar. Now this has been proven by Jewish scholars and Christian scholars and even atheistic scholars that the date of 853 BC is precise and 100% accurate for this non-biblical source. It results in giving us a real date of the Exodus. On top of that, it even gives us the real date when Abraham entered the land that God told him to go to. You don't miss this. So I'm going to see you in Lesson 77. And until then, let's pray. Let's pray a prayer based upon the Aaronic Blessing in number 624 through 26. Yevarech keinu Adonai veishmarakeinu. Yair Adonai panav aleinu veikunakeinu. Yisa Adonai panav aleinu Viasem lanu shalom. Veshem Yeshua Adonenu. Amen. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and may he give us his shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen.